This is episode 139 of the Terms of Reference podcast. We've been investing in our own research. We've been developing tools and different models to help inform how do you go about taking an integrated approach to development that is effective. This is Terms of Reference. I'm your host, Stephen Laddick. The challenges faced by communities in developing contexts around the world are anything but simple. Climate change, protracted conflict, gender issues, food scarcity, natural resource management, these and the hundreds of other topics that development professionals work on every day are complex by their very nature. Working effectively within these complex systems requires an integrated approach that considers the many factors affecting a community, all at the same time. As one sort of off-the-cuff example, think about adequate healthcare systems require educational support, which requires funding and facilities, which need a sound foundation of infrastructure and policy. And that's just looking at it from a practical how-to perspective. Adding in cultural, environmental, and unsavory factors such as conflict weaves a web that is difficult to untangle. My guest for the 139th episode of the Terms of Reference podcast, Patrick Fine, sees the creation of an evidence base for integrated development as a critical success factor for the future of our sector. As the CEO of FHI 360, Patrick oversees a truly global development operation, one that not only implements programming, but also seeks to create new knowledge from which everyone can benefit. I have no doubt you'll enjoy this wide-ranging conversation about how FHI 360 is positioning themselves for the future of development. I spoke with Patrick in Durham, North Carolina. Hi guys, just a quick reminder before we start the show that supporting the Terms of Reference podcast really does matter. Please take a moment to leave a comment on the blog or our Facebook page, or just share this episode with your friends on Twitter. And if you never want to miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to TOR on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite app may be. Now, on to the show with Patrick. Hello Patrick, thank you so much for being on the Terms of Reference podcast today. Uh, Thanks Stephen, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Patrick, you are the CEO of FHI 360. I mean, that underscores your, the fact that you're a world traveler. I'm sure that you're around the world a couple of times a year. But where do we find you today? Today I'm in our headquarters in Durham, North Carolina. Okay, excellent. What's the weather like in North Carolina here in the, the end of January? It's a, it's a beautiful, sunny day with a wonderful blue sky. It's supposed to hit 70 degrees, so... Uh, clear indication that climate change is alive and real <laughs> in North Carolina oh, since on January what 25th it should be 70 degrees here oh wow you know I usually start out these conversations because we interview organizations all over the world and often they are not known because you are sitting at uh, in, you know at the chair of an organization that is quite well known rather than asking you about what the FHI 360 does I'm wondering if I can ask you how would you position or describe FHI 360 over a beer with someone who has never heard of the development sector or the humanitarian aid sector? What is it that you do? What is it you try to accomplish? What's your purpose? Yeah, our purpose is summed up in our tagline, which is the science of improving lives. So we try to bring evidence and knowledge together in order to address human development challenges. And we do that through a global platform. So we are a large, sophisticated, multinational organization. We work in over 70 countries. We uh, work across many sectors. So we have 11 different technical practice areas that we work in, uh, in health, in education, in economic development as well as addressing cross-cutting themes such as youth issues, gender issues, and technology. So you have a unique vantage point of how does FHI 360, you know, use this global framework, use this global organization to deliver on that promise, to bend and change these these mandates that you get from, you know, either the grants or the contracts or the services that, you know, you win to change how we're serving people in need. Uh, That's really sort of the the goal of what we're trying to discuss. Yeah, we try to do it in two ways. One is by using knowledge that exists within the community. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So we try to take what we know from our own practice, 
what we can find from the practice of others and apply it in smart ways. We take a people-centered approach. So we put a lot of emphasis on upfront design, how we interact with our partners, our collaborators, the communities where we're operating in, to apply knowledge in a thoughtful and practical way so it can have a real impact. The second piece is we generate knowledge. So it's not just about using knowledge that exists, it's about creating new knowledge through innovation through looking at our experience and being thoughtful and systematic about what's working and what's not working, documenting that, and then sharing that with the broader development community. So we are both a learning organization, so we're trying to constantly learn from our own experience. We're also trying to share that with the rest of the world. So for example, in the last year, We've published uh, over 185 peer-reviewed journal articles, which would be an example of taking what we've learned and sharing that with the broader community, as well as um, using social media and other platforms for sharing information, sharing methods, describing experiences. We put a value on describing both what works and, and what's not working because we think we need to learn from both. Maybe an off-the-cuff question, though. It, 185 journal articles, I mean, that's, that's impressive by anybody's standards. But versus social media, versus Twitter, versus you know, the power of, of the Facebook you know, wall or the, you know, the, the feed that's coming through, right. do you have a gut about you know, which one gets through better to the communities that you're trying to affect or even the policymakers you're trying to affect? <laughs> I think that you have different audiences that use different platforms. So, for example, with a lot of our scientific research, the best way to get that information out and have it have a real impact on people's practice is through peer-reviewed journal articles. So we do a lot of research on HIV AIDS, for example, on family planning, on developing new contraceptive methods, and the way to advance uh, knowledge and practice in those areas really is through peer-reviewed journals. Also in education, we, we just published a book about education, the relationship between education and conflict that provides terrific data. I think the most complete data set that exists right now hmm. on that relationship between level of education and level of conflict in countries that was supported by UNICEF and is a, a valuable set of data. So there are certain audiences where um, those more formal platforms are going to be the best way to disseminate knowledge. But then if we also have a very robust uh, effort through Facebook, through our website, through Twitter, through Instagram, through different social media that operate both centrally, so at a corporate level, and then I, we're a decentralized organization. So we have regional offices in Bangkok and Pretoria. We have country offices in, in uh, 40 countries around the world. And then we have project offices in some countries. And so those offices also uh, seek to be part of the development fabric of the communities where they operate. They are almost uniformly led by leaders from their own countries or from the region that are respected thought leaders in their own right, in their sectors, and in their countries and communities. And so we do track the uh, amount of traffic that comes across our different platforms, whether it's social media platforms or whether it's uh, the more traditional platforms. And what we see is a huge uh, interaction between our development professionals uh, and the ideas that they're talking about and the broader development community. Mm. As you're thinking about, again, global organization, regional offices, your, your, your fingerprints are, are all over the globe. You're the spokesperson for this organization. You're the figurehead. Is there a go-to 
story that you tell when you are introducing the organization or, you know, a, a result that you had, maybe an unexpected result or an aha moment, maybe from the last one or two years that you just thought, wow, you know, we were going in this direction on, on HIV AIDS or, or we were going in this direction on elementary education and we ended up doing something completely different. To be honest, we're involved in so many sectors. There are many particular examples uh, where the work we're doing is having deep impact on uh, the practice of uh, international development or, the, or deep impact in the communities where we're operating. Uh, one example is mobile money. So we've done a lot to help uh, institutions in developing countries in West Africa, in East Africa, use mobile money in ways that improve their ability to operate effectively. And an example would be to help a ministry of education in Liberia pay its teachers through mobile money, which has a tremendous impact on the lives of the teachers who now don't have to, to travel long distances to get their paychecks cashed. It has a big impact on the quality of education because you don't have teachers absent trying to get their paychecks cash mm -hmm. and it reduces the opportunities for corruption because you've got a better record keeping system an electronic record keeping system so mobile money for paying teachers for paying nurses for paying community health workers i see that as one game-changing innovation over the last few years it's gathering momentum uh, we've been central in doing that with support from USAID through a project called MSTAR, where we've helped institutions, both government and non-government institutions, civil society institutions, learn how to use mobile money and then apply it in their practice. That would be one example. But if I can go across our sectors We've had a huge impact on nutrition. So, as you know, in many countries, stunting is an absolute binding constraint on mm -hmm. national development. And it reduces the potential productivity and the potential opportunities that a person will have in their lives if they're malnourished in their first thousand days. So we have... A flagship nutrition programs, one which is funded by the Gates Foundation called Alive and Thrive, which has had tremendous impact in India, in Ethiopia, in Vietnam, in improving the nutritional practices that individual at the household level, so that children in that first thousand days are well nourished so that the families use good feeding practices so mothers breastfeed um, and then when they shift from breast milk to solid foods that that is done in an informed well uh, educated way that would be another example of a program that has impacted millions of lives in a very positive way that will have a long-term impact, not just on the families and the communities involved, but on the nations themselves. I want to circle back a little bit to the, to the financial technology, the fintech example that you gave yeah. on mobile money. One of the things we've been talking a lot about on this podcast is the problems or the difficulties, the potential difficulties with working in the aid sector where you, you, know, you receive government funding or you re receive you know, what would be considered earmarked funding, right? And yet yeah. you're working in a space where that has iterative development and it has shifts and turns and pivots. What has been your experience in navigating those waters of, of, of running programs that... Again, you know, you sort of propose one thing, you're able to win the award, and then as you're going down the road, you're like, mm, well, it turns out a little bit different. It, how do you work with your, your donors? I mean, obviously, USAID is your biggest donor, but across the board, have you, have you sensed that that conversation is changing? I sense that people are grappling with it. You've described the problem well. Very often, 
we see that the way budgets are structured. So if you get right down to the project implementation level and then how you're applying resources to it, to achieve certain planned outcomes, there is this interest in adaptable management. And I see that coming in particularly from the private sector and particularly from the technical sector from Silicon Valley, this idea about iterative development and adaptive management. And I see donors, USAID, but other donors as well, being interested in how do they apply those methods in the business models and the way they design and implement projects. There is a challenge that I don't think is resolved yet, which is how do you balance that iterative approach with the demand for accountability in terms of producing certain outcomes on a specific agreed upon schedule? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at the M&E plans uh, that lay out what the benchmarks for measuring progress are, it's hard to reconcile those with an iterative approach that would allow you to change those benchmarks based on, say, quarterly progress. And I think that's a challenge that is not yet resolved and one that we certainly grapple with. So you can think about that as how do you build in flexibility into projects? There are ways to do it where you put in specific provisions in the grants and contracts that allow you to jointly with the funder and with your counterparts to evaluate periodically what the experience is, what the progress is, what has changed within the context of what you're doing and where adjustments need to be made. So that would be one way to address that problem in a more systematic way. I think there still needs to be a lot of work just on the methods that allow us to apply that Silicon Valley approach or that iterative management approach to the, the more structured methods that we use to seek accountability for results with public funds. And I think part of the challenge comes down to the difference between using public funds and using private funds. Mm, I don't think as a development community or as people, practitioners in this area, that we've done enough to discuss the different mandates and the dynamics and the realities of uh, management requirements for public funds versus management requirements for private funds. Mm -hmm. Where my mind was kind of floating as you were giving your, your explanation was the other more, let's, you know, for lack of a better term, messy type of operations, right? It, on your podcast, you, you have a podcast called A Deeper Look. On your most recent uh, episode, you were talking about peaceful and inclusive societies, right? Right. And conflict resolution, building a, a resilient community that's that's, you know, integrated and, and people getting getting people to work together, communities that have been in conflict for a long time. These aren't sort of widget deliverables that you can count on. And so even iterative development doesn't really work there in, in that regard. Does that resonate with you as well? It does, although to some extent in that space, in that either humanitarian crisis response space or that relief to development space, I find that funders provide more latitude to the implementers because they know that it's a messy space. And so they know that there's a need to constantly being adjusted because circumstances are, are changing quickly on the ground. In the more traditional development delivery space, there's a lot of pressure, as you know, on measuring results and the whole issue of determining what works and what doesn't work and having more rigorous approaches to measurement, I think runs head on into the desire for adaptive management and more iterative approaches and that it's an unreconciled tension 
where the same people who want more rigorous approaches are also wanting to promote adaptive or, or iterative methods. Mm. For me, it's, it's one of the fascinating challenges that we face as designers and implementers of programs that address human development. And, it, you know, there are some basic issues that it boils down to. One is it's very difficult to replicate program outcomes in the same way that you would replicate a scientific experiment. Mm. So replicability is an issue. Scalability becomes an issue just because you're working in complex social settings where the um, circumstances and the conditions from one community are different in, e even in a neighboring community. Mm. Related issue has to do with research and development in terms of being able to address, say, figure out, okay, if, if we've got some methodological challenges, how do we solve those? I believe they're solvable, but in order to solve them, it requires investment in research and development. And one of the big gaps that I see in our community is it's difficult to get funding for research and development. Even if you look at the iterative or adaptive approaches, one of the constraints with that approach is that that requires a different kind of funding structure that's willing to uh, recognize that one avenue you've been marching down hasn't panned out and now you need to shift to a different path. And that requires that funding to, to make that shift. So. I think a fundamental need in our in the development community and in, in our space is for a conversation around financing for research and development. And if you just compare it to both the private sector or to the military sector, and you look at the amount of money that goes into R&D in either of those domains, and you compare it to the amount of funding that goes into R&D in the international development arena, there's really no comparison. And so it's not surprising that uh, it's more difficult for us to resolve the tensions or the challenges and to uh, make quicker progress in developing methods and sharing those methods in ways that then become replicable and add to our ability to effectively deliver. Does that mean that we then have to convince traditional donors, governments, to act more like an investor that looks at you know, the return they're going to receive for that R&D? Is the social good or is the policy achieve, you know, outcome or is the stability that they seek rather than, you know, in the private sector, you know, it's you, you invest a billion dollars in, in creating Xanax because it's the profit return for the next 30 years, right? I mean, yes, I think the outcome that we're trying to achieve are effective methods of dealing with what are now complex and, and sophisticated human development challenges that take place in urban settings, in settings where you've got multiple complex factors that you're trying to balance that maybe they may be ethnic issues or religious issues or economic and class and social issues and that coming up with good methods for approaching those issues of ensuring that people have opportunities to lead productive lives if they've got the kind of food security and nutrition that is going to allow them to do that, that they've got the health and education that opens up those those opportunities, that that requires a certain amount of research and development investment. And up to now, what we do is we take our experience in implementing projects and we try to convert that into a sort of R&D practice by sharing our experience. Even that is difficult because there's not a lot of resources that is put into providing those kinds of opportunities. Mm -hmm. It's often seen as a luxury. But two, there isn't a whole lot of dedicated 
R&D funding that is simply to look at specific problems and say, how do we how do we tackle that problem? The one area where you get more of it is in health. A lot of that, I think, has been driven by the rise of mega foundations. Gates is the one that has really set the benchmark by being willing to put real money, big money, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars into research efforts to look at how do we eradicate malaria. But outside of the health sector, I see a lot less willingness by funders to make those R&D investments. And so what you get is organizations like FHI 360 that use their own funding. We, we use our own unrestricted funds to invest in R&D. So an example would be we took some of our own resources and we started an initiative on integrated development because as we look forward into the future, we see that because of the complexity and sophistication of the human development challenges that the world's facing, we need to have less siloed, more people-centered, more integrated approaches to addressing and overcoming those challenges. But there isn't a lot of um, research that has been done on how to, how do you best do that. There's not a strong evidence base on what works and what doesn't work. There's not a strong base in terms of practices chronicling experiences around the globe. So at the grassroots, we recognize it, we've done it. But in terms of, of having a shareable body of usable evidence that can then inform practice in that donors, uh, governments, and practitioners use to design and implement projects, that's not really there. And so we've been investing in doing that. We've been investing in our own research. We've been developing tools and different uh, models to help inform how do you go about taking an integrated approach to development that is effective and what works and what doesn't work, uh, what do you need to take into consideration? That's an example where we're doing that with our own resources, primarily with our own resources. You know, you've, you've led me to the sort of the next part of our conversation that I wanted to get to was, is this the process that you've just described about how innovation happens within your organization as well? So not only capturing the stories that are going on at that grassroots level, but do you have active feelers out there saying, look, we, we, we found a different way to solve this problem, or there's, there's this new thing, and we need to bubble it up, we need to capture it, and we need to be able to scale it across at least our practice. So it, in, there's a concerted the effort. That we put a high value on in the organization is trying to have a culture that promotes innovation. So part of that is organic. It bubbles up, and it's just from a management point of view, encouraging people to raise new ideas, to be willing to try new things, to push the envelope with their supervisors or with us as an organization, and to just create incentives within the organization for people to try new things. So that's the organic approach. We also have some very structured approaches to promoting innovation. So we, again, using our own resources, we have a program called the Catalyst Fund, where we allocate resources every year to allow staff to propose an innovative idea and to get a small grant from us, from FHI 360, to pursue an idea they have. And what that does is one, it's a kind of R&D funding Two, it provides staff with an opportunity to pursue something they're passionate about that there's no donor funding for. And then three, we take those innovations and then many of those become really effective tools that we can build into our programs and that increase our competitiveness as an organization because it gives us more to offer to our funders and our partners because we've invested the funding and we've supported our staff to pursue 
their innovative ideas. An example of that in Southeast Asia, which is where you are based right now, mm-hmm. is the development of an app for uh, mobile tutoring to help tutor kids who have to pass their secondary school leaving exam, which, as you know, is a high stakes exam. We've developed a a program called Reach, which provides a a mobile platform for helping kids prep for that exam. That came out of a catalyst idea of some of our staff who they saw the issue. They had an idea for how to address it. We provided some seed funding for them to to do that, and now they've developed that application. Is there anything Um, that has either come out of the Catalyst Fund or through the more organic policy that you have across the organization that has fundamentally changed either the way that you design programs or the way that you administer yourself or the way that you, you you operate as an organization? You know, somebody suggested something, and the point here is, has anything bubbled up and become a standard operation you know, under your tenure? Yeah, a couple of the areas that have had, say, a profound impact. One is integrated development, which I mentioned. So our investments in that have, we've built in some mechanisms within the organization. Organizational innovations for getting more synergy across the many practice areas and cross-cutting things that we have in the organization. So like any, or like almost all big organizations, we are organized into technical areas where we have specialists who have expertise in specific areas. One of the weaknesses we identified a, a couple years ago was that we don't have enough synergy amongst those areas of expertise, and that reduces our ability to provide effective solutions. And so we've worked a lot on this idea of integration, both in terms of externally, but also internally. How do we integrate our own operations? How do Mm -hmm. we more effectively take advantage of the synergy within the amazing resources within the organization? And one institutional innovation we did is we created something called the Integrators Network, Again, this is using our own resources because you don't have donors willing to, to fund this sort of what, thing. What, you, you mean USAID won't fund your own internal marketplace? Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, let's not pick on, on USAID. USAID, I think if you look at their global development lab and you look at the direction they've taken over the last uh, eight years, they've put a lot of effort and resources behind the idea of innovation. Touché. So it's it's not specific to any one funder, but just more broadly within the community, getting back to the dynamics of how public funds work, it's hard to get resources to fund something like our uh, integrators network, where what we do is we identify people across the organization, so across geographies, and across technical sectors, so around the world and in different technical sectors, and we give them a certain amount of time that we cover with our own resources so they can focus on building synergies with other geographies and other technical sectors. Now, for me, that's a very interesting organizational innovation, but it's not one that your typical program funder is going to be willing to fund because it's not one that you can easily measure. This is the specific outcome you're going to get in the next six months or in the next year. You're talking about disrupting. You know, you're talking about how do we, you learned internally, you learned that, you know, you have these cross-cutting themes, you have these, this global organization, we need to learn how to work internally better, not only, and, and, and as well as we work integrated in our programming, right? What's the biggest disruption that you're looking at that's going to change the way that you operate, you know, over the next two to three years? And it's a loaded question because we know the, the election of President Trump happened recently. There's so much unknown, right? There's still so much kind of kind of what's happening, but he's starting to sign executive orders. He's starting, you know, he has it. We have an interim USAID administrator. How is this administration going to impact the way that you do business or, or how you might be able to deliver to those in need? So let me address the issue of disruption on a couple of levels. First, specifically with respect to the new administration that's coming into office, 
There's still a great deal of uncertainty about exactly what its policies are going to be and which directions it's going to want to go to. And you have people in the development community, both in the U.S. development community and in the international development community, in a sense trying to read the tea leaves to see, well, what will the priorities be and what kind of changes can we expect? And the honest answer right now as of January 25th is that we don't really know If you look at the testimony of people like the candidate for Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, and you look at some of the people who are engaged in the um, transition team, you see people who have a commitment to U.S. global engagement. They understand the importance of U.S. global engagement. And personally, I'm optimistic that what we're going to see is the U.S. continue to play an important critical role in addressing the human development challenges um, around the world, both because it's in our own national interest. So to take the administration's theme of America first, that the only way we can serve our own national interests is by, by being fully engaged internationally and by addressing human development challenges. And so some of that thinking you can see in the comments of people during their confirmation hearings and you you can see it in comments coming out of the transition team. But the specific directions, the specific priorities and any changes to operating systems, we, we just don't know. So from a disruption point of view, at this moment of time, Uh, What you could say is disrupted is just a level of uncertainty about exactly what those directions will be. Before you go to the other levels of disruption, can I ask you a follow up there? In the back of my mind, you know, in the in the circles I run in and the community that we have, I've continued to say, look, no matter what happens, the same answer is still available today that it was yesterday and it will be five years from now. Show up deliver results, prove that you have value that, you know, people want and are raving about. It's no different from, you know, the pharmaceutical sector as it is for peace and conflict and for, you know, global health solutions. Would you agree with that? Or, or do you think that there's nuance there that I'm missing? No, I completely agree with that. I think that at the end of the day, it comes down to what value are you adding? For an organization like ours, we're constantly looking at Uh, the work we do and looking at new opportunities. And the question we ask is, what value do we have to add? And if you take that to a larger geopolitical level and you say, what value does the U.S. have to add in terms of its global engagement? I think you get a very clear, compelling response that there is a huge value to add both in terms of what we can contribute to fostering well-being, prosperity, and security in the broader world, and then how that benefits our own national interests here at home. So I think that framing it from the value-add point of view is, is an effective way of looking at it. It's simple, it's easy to understand, and it really captures the essence of why it's in our interest to be globally engaged. Mm. What were the other levels of disruption? that? So the other level of, of disruption that I see really is one that I see the, a growing inequality amongst nations and then within nations and almost two worlds. So that you can be um, in a place like Bangkok where you are, which is a very modern city that works very well, and then just 40 minutes away on an airplane flight, you can be in a place that is very, very different in terms of the level of services, the level of infrastructure, and the standard of living. So I think that the growing inequality that we see in the world between those people and communities that have growing standards of living, that have momentum, which is driving modernization, attracting 
private investment and creating a kind of engine of growth versus those places that are not attracting private investment, where those engines of growth are not working well and where you have a kind of poverty trap is the biggest disruptor I see on the horizon. Mm. In a way, in those modernizing places, we use the term disruption because we see this rapid change. And you see lots of things being disrupted. You see uh, institutional systems being disrupted. Um, You see technology bringing in new ways of doing things. And for the most part, those are driving improving standards of living, better health status, and overall positive change. In those places where where that kind of engine of growth or that vibrant dynamic energy isn't hasn't taken hold, I don't see much disruption. <laughs> and in there, many of the approaches that we've, it may be more appropriate to use older tried and true approaches to addressing the development challenges in a country where that modernization dynamic hasn't really taken off, then to be thinking about how do we disrupt things. So what I see is growing inequality in some societies and some countries and communities, that's leading to dynamic growth and modernization where we can identify or seek disruption, and it's a positive kind of disruption because it's leading to improved living standards, greater opportunities for people, societies able to create opportunities for their citizens to live productive, meaningful lives. And what it sounded to me like where you were leading as well, though, were those investments, those injections of technology, of new you know, connection with the world, etc., aren't happening. It's almost the reverse, right? Where that divide, that chasm ends up becoming even larger because every year that you're... That's exactly right. Every year that you're left at a loop. It's the right term in that case. And sometimes I think if we look at those countries that are uh, most fragile or where they're the low-income countries that aren't attracting private investment, that don't fit this characterization of dynamic, growing middle class and rising living standards, applying the concepts of disruption to those places may not make sense. And yet we still are doing it because it's working in one set of countries. And we see these are the solutions that are contributing to improved social and economic standards. So let's just apply those to these countries where it's not happening. And I'm not sure if that's the right approach. I think, again, that's an area where it would be good to have more research. More research, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And more thought about in those countries that are stuck at the bottom in the poverty traps, do we need a different set of approaches? And I actually suspect, having visited many of them, that some of the old approaches that we used in the past that we now think of as obsolete and antiquated may still be the appropriate approach in a country like the Central African Republic, which is mired in conflict, where you've got humanitarian crisis, where you still don't have effective governance. Some of those older approaches might be the more appropriate ones. Mm. Two final questions for you that I ask every guest here on this innovation series. And the the first one, I'm excited to hear what your answer is because you're the CEO of, of, you know, one of the large organizations in our sector. Who do you pay attention to to make sure that you are staying savvy? You know, do you follow blog posts? Do you have a Twitter feed that you followed? Are there magazines? Who who do you listen to that you think other people should, should know about? A lot of people across many, many sectors. So in in my position, I one, I'm naturally curious. Two, I just try to take in as much as I can about what's happening in our space. And there is so much that's happening that it is overwhelming. 
Um, but individuals that I pay attention to because I see them as real thought leaders, Gail Smith is one, the outgoing administrator of USAID. She's experienced both, you know, from the grassroots up to the policy level. She's thoughtful. She's articulate. She's a, a real development person who has an informed view on the world that adds real value to thinking about how do we address these issues. In the area of philanthropy and, and of corporate engagement, so we see that as a hugely important part of development looking forward is corporate engagement, especially in those countries that are dynamic and growing. Michael Bidzak at Johnson & Johnson, I think, is a really useful reference. He uh, shares lots of information that is uh, very informative. He himself has a great perspective on these questions of development generally and then of the role of corporate organizations, the, the commercial business community in advancing development solutions. So he's, I see him as a great resource. In terms of technology for development, I pay a lot of attention to Ann May Chang, who is the outgoing uh, director of USAID's Global Development Lab. She comes from Silicon Valley. She's super thoughtful, very innovative in the way she sees things. She brings a different dimension from the traditional kind of development thinking that, frankly, somebody like I would bring. I find her perspective refreshing, informative, useful, and very practical. So uh, ideas that you can use. Mohamed Pate, who is the former Minister of State for Health in Nigeria, he's currently the um, executive director of a foundation called Big Win Philanthropy is another person who brings both a uh, hands-on experience with dealing with uh, development issues as a practitioner, as a policymaker, as a implementer, and as a donor. And he's super thoughtful in his approach. In fact, I recorded a podcast with uh, Dr. Pate that we haven't published yet. I think it's coming out in March. But if people tune into that podcast, that's the Deeper Look podcast, Dr. Pate has such great insights to, to share with respect to the topics we're talking about today. Mm. Well, well, we'll make sure that the link to your podcast is also on our blog when this episode goes live as well. That's great. Thank you. L last question for you, and I'm super excited to hear what your answer is because here you are. You're the CEO, giant organization, but you know, you just said you know, you're a constant learner. You're, you're naturally curious. You're out there. What innovation are you most excited about and you know we've had everybody talk from we've had people talk about everything from drones you know to to cash you know direct cash to different processes is there one thing or one organization or one process out there that you'd like to give a shout out to that you just think is ultra cool geek out on if i had to pick one looking out into the future in terms of what i think is going to shape the way we approach human development challenges, it would be integrated development. So taking more integrated approaches to how we address challenges. So combining uh, both across sectors, so education and nutrition, and cross-cutting themes like youth and technology, and finding ways of putting those together into cost-effective approaches that are manageable, that are, that are workable, and that then meet people where they are that provide uh, services and program approaches that reflect the way people live their lives. And if you look at the sustainable development goals, that notion of an integrated approach is built in to the SDGs and is integral to them. I see that as something where there will be continued efforts to figure out how to do that effectively. And it's not easy because it runs counter to the way funding usually flows. It runs counter to the way we're organized as organizations. 
it's more difficult to manage in a matrix than in a straight line. That's just a simple truth. But in terms of providing effective development solutions, meeting people where they live, I think that's the uh, method or the innovation that is going to help drive prosperity, drive living standards in the coming years. Patrick, this has been a fantastic conversation. I think that people listening are going to get a lot of value out. Thank you so much for being on the show today. This was great talking to you. Thank you. You've been listening to the Terms of Reference podcast from aidpreneur.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes. (laughs) 